Every time you've seen one of George Lucas's Star Wars movies, you probably wondered, how did he do that? How did he do all those special effects? Tonight, we'll take you behind the scenes of the new Star Wars film, perhaps the most eagerly anticipated movie ever, to show you how he does it. Why don't you take this guy, put him over here. All right. Back in there. Back take back. another one like him and stick him over here. In a darkened screening room, George Lucas is using a laser pointer to show the 45 computer animators who are working on his new Star Wars movie, the first in 15 years, just how he wants a big battle scene to look. And then keep this guy here. Okay. And then have him firing, instead of firing dead off to the right, have him fire over here. Everybody here works for Industrial Light and Magic a special effects company Lucas created two decades ago to make the first Star Wars. Computer technology has advanced so much since then that the digital effects in the new episode are to the original roughly what talkies were to silent pictures. It's like sketching with a pencil and suddenly somebody gives you paint and it's got you have all these colors and you've always seen what you've been painting in color but you've never had the color to do it with so now finally I've got color and so now I can paint the way I was originally seeing things and I like that so do all the animators at industrial light and magic ILM they don't just turn out special effects for Lucas you name it the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park the tornadoes in Twister, the aliens in Men in Black, they all came out of the computers at ILM. Now, with Star Wars, Lucas is expecting ILM to set a new standard in WOW. The work is so complicated and meticulous that each animator is responsible for just two seconds of finished film per week. Twice a week, they show their blink of an eye shots to the boss. Now this is the new Darth Maul jumping off. Hmm. Yeah, that's a lot better. I think that works way better now. You've seen these before, and yeah. there have been changes, and now this and is now the I'm final approval. The changes. Yeah, I love this. See, this, is, this, is, this was actually shot out in the desert in 150 degree heat. Now, how did you do those animals? Are they camels that you've changed? No, they're all cyber animals. Cyber animals? There's a new term. Actually, it's one of the big breakthroughs in the new movie. All kinds of cyber characters completely conjured up from the computer. That guy's a cyber character. He's not real. The guy that was jumping. The way they used to make movies, that guy would have been a stunt double. In Lucas's movie, stunt doubles are just created in the computer. And not just doubles. He has several computer-generated lead characters full of personality and, and, well, humanity. Look at this early version of the scene shot on location and covered with Lucas's editing notes. Any public credits? Any public credits are no good out here. I need something more real. Back at the computer, the guy in the hat gets deleted and replaced by a digital character. Only his voice remains. Republic credits? Republic credits are no good out here. I need something more real. I don't have it's ninety five percent a digital movie. Which means that it's got digital characters or digital sets or something going on in it where most movies, you know, it's about five to ten minutes at the most. I mean, George has said, Okay, we're gonna make a digital backlog movie. What is it, 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 define that digital well, backlight? Well, you shoot a lot of the scenes where the actors with small sets and a lot of blue screens behind them because you're going to enlarge it. You're going to do something you can't do any other way. On the digital back lot, a lightsaber fight can be shot like this and then made to look like this. Well, like that, that shot you saw of the landing platform. Yes. Uh, well, there's a whole scene that takes, well, actually, there's two scenes that take place on that landing platform. Well, you couldn't build that set. I mean, there's just no way you could actually build something like that because it's in a completely fictitious city, a completely fictitious environment. It starts down in the library oh, in research, and this. then it comes up here to oh, conceptualize, God. and the art department designs the stuff while I'm writing the screenplay. Lucas began writing more than four years ago. As he did, 
his team of artists, headed by Doug Chang, started sketching and painting and modeling, working toward the Lucas seal of approval. I say, I need a bunch of creatures. Things. <laughs> you know, give me a whole bunch of different creatures. So there's a bunch of artists, and they also have a contest, and they kind of, everybody submits stuff. And I say, well, I like this, but I like the head of this one. I want to put it on the body of this one. I like this, I like that. I like these features. And Special like attention was paid to lead characters like this guy named Jar Jar. How did great... those ears come about? Because we originally came up with Jar Jar. He had really short dog ears, and George thought he'd be more funny and have more personality with these big elephant-like ears. I think... Once Lucas approved those ears, the model was sent to ILM and actually scanned into a computer in 3D. That's when Rob Coleman and his team of animators took over. The whole technology had to be developed to handle the ears because of the interaction of the cloth and the ears for this back. So that had to be invented. That wasn't here before. There was a little inklings of it. And, but, and you know. clothing. Nobody had ever done real clothing before. I mean, realistic clothing that moves. Yeah. And he, he's a major character, so yeah. he has to have a real range yes. oh, of yeah. expressions and oh, emotions. Yeah. We have 400 little sliders that we can change, everything from cheek puffs to eye blinks to muscle bends to everything that layers into making this character as believable as the live-action characters standing beside him. The, the bar is at the highest when you have live-action right on the screen. The audience is watching Liam Neeson, and they've got Jar Jar there. And Liam Neeson is real, 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 real. And then we have to come up and make ours as real, because if we don't, the audience will pick up on it immediately and say, there's something about that that's not, I don't believe that. Yeah. So you're out of the movie. It looks, yeah. it looks like yeah. Roger you're Rabbit. Taking it. You yeah. can't have it be like Roger Rabbit. For 90% of the audience, you have to make it so that they just say, I don't know how they did it, it just was a real character. Some purists worry that Lucas is making his computer characters too real. You know, people come and they say, oh, all this digital stuff, you know, doesn't that make everything phony? Doesn't that make it, you know, it's not true, it's not real. I said, you know, movies aren't true. It's all fake. The story is fake. Hello. The characters are fake. The sets are fake. There is no city there. That's not New York City. You go behind it. It's a big piece of wood with a painting on it. Uh, and all I'm doing is I've taken it to the next step. And now I can create digital characters. There wouldn't be any point in creating a, an actor. He says he'll never take the step of creating fake humans. Hey, Jar Jar. Huh? He prefers his digital characters to be originals, not copies. <laughs> Just how big a technical milestone will the new movie be? We went to no less an authority than Steven Spielberg, one of Lucas's best friends and biggest customers. He's now not only taken images but he's taken skies and clouds and backgrounds and atmospheres and light and shadow and he's painted a world that would be cost prohibitive to do the old-fashioned way and it's not cost prohibitive uh well george owns ilm so i'm not quite sure what kind of a break he's he's getting from his own company i have a feeling if, if i had made this movie it would cost at least four times what it cost george to make that's also because spielberg's films are bankrolled by hollywood Lucas is paying for Star Wars entirely on his own. So he has an almost unprecedented amount of independence and control. When I make a movie, I pay attention to how much it costs, but at the same time I get to, you know, I get to do the things that I want to do without somebody arbitrarily coming in and saying, no, you can't do that. You know, you don't need that in the movie. That happened to Lucas at the beginning. Studio executives cut five minutes from his first hit, American Graffiti. That put a bitter taste in his mouth about Hollywood, and it sounded to us as if his resentment is as strong as ever. The problem is the studio executives. The problem is that the studios used to be owned by people who cared about the movies. Now they're corporations. They don't love movies. They don't go to movies. They don't know what a movie is. And they do focus groups to try to determine who will go see a movie. And Hollywood does that. And All Hollywood does that. And they try to change the story to fit what they polling think results. what the polling results are. And you can't do that. That's not the way you make movies. Um, because it is not a business. You know, it's an art form. An art form Lucas controls completely. While his animators need his approval for every move they make, another group of artists need him to sign off on every sound effect in the movie. Ben Bird is in charge of all that sound. Very little of what has been on this film is truly synthesized. We record naturally existing sounds and modify them 
and process them. I have here my electric shaver and a salad bowl from home. And um, I discovered one day that if I took the electric shaver and put it in the salad bowl, and moved it around, that you could get a very interesting resonance. And kind of like a little musical instrument. When we saw those big transports come overhead, yeah. it had that really weird sound. That's it. Very disturbing. That's a that's, that's, that's salad really bowl. Today, Bird is putting sound into a sequence called the pod race. Think drag racers in outer space. How long will you work on a scene, Ben? Like this one with so many layers. Well, I've been with this scene for three years. <laughs> he has to build it in layers. First, the dialogue. Oh, this is gonna be messy. Me not watching. Then crowd noise. Then announcers. Start your engines. And finally, all those engines. And Lucas is still trying to make each individual engine sound this just the way he wants. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 and then the Annie's just rear, 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 and then the, the, so the idea of each one having a separate pulse. Each one has a separate pulse so that they, mm -hmm. they build on top of each other and they don't, mm -hmm. they don't collide with each other. Right. Look lower. Right. A few weeks later in London, Lucas gets the final layer of sound as a 100-piece orchestra, an 88-voice choir, and composer John Williams record a rousing score. Uh, I enjoy the music more than anything because I don't have to do anything. I just let him do it. I said, you know, I want something very powerful and very, very uh, uplifting. And, you know, and then he writes something brilliant. The musical score is the only part of the movie over which Lucas does not exercise absolute control. You're really creating this as, we, as you go along, and, you, mm -hmm. and the movie's coming out in May. Well, <laughs> you do it day by day, moment by moment, layer by layer. It's just, it's like watching a painter. You just, you know, you put colors, you put colors. It's not done until it's done, you know, until you put the final stroke on it. He says he won't apply the final stroke until about two weeks before the movie opens. That would be suicidal for most filmmakers, but Lucas has his own digital playground, so he can keep directing that battle scene over and over and over. And uh, this guy back here doesn't actually have to get killed. Oh, he can still be there. We'll kill him off screen. It's unusual enough for George Lucas to let anyone, including us, behind the scenes of his new movie. When we come back, he takes us behind the scenes of his life. On September 19, 1777, British troops under the command of General Burgoyne attacked General Horatio Gates' American forces concentrated behind massive fortifications at Bemis Heights near Saratoga, New York. Cut off by Benedict Arnold, Burgoyne withdrew, but attacked again on October 17, 1777. Outnumbered and suffering heavy losses with no hope of reinforcements, Burgoyne retreated to Saratoga Heights, where he surrendered his army of more than 5,000 men to General Gates, thus setting the stage for France to recognize American independence and enter the war on the side of the colonies. Hang gliding makes it possible for a human to jump free of the land and fly away like a bird. Student flyers learn all aspects of the sport, theory and ground school, rules of the air, and handling and care of the equipment. Beginning on low hills and learning from a few mistakes, student flyers eventually graduate to more challenging landscapes.
To these adventurers, there is no other way to see America. No better way to experience the wonders of flight. Listen to the heartbeat of the Earth. All life depends on that beat. The Earth has always provided for us. Today, as in the past, we must keep this heart strong. Give back to the Earth. Write Harmony, Box 2890, Washington, D.C., 20013. Harmony, a partnership with a healthy land. Monday primetime begins with the news magazine 60 Minutes. Then catch the comedy on Sports Night and Everybody Loves Raymond. From the streets to the courts, law and order. AFN Tonight. George Lucas is the most famous movie maker you've never seen. He rarely does interviews and he definitely isn't on the Hollywood party circuit. In fact, he lives and works outside of San Francisco, hundreds of miles away from Hollywood. There's a lot more to George Lucas than we realized. We discovered that he's not a recluse, as some have said, who sits up there doing nothing but work on his futuristic movies. The new Star Wars movie is the first film George Lucas has directed since the very first installment more than 20 years ago. As you take your helmet off, then you can just sort of wave to everybody. But before you conclude that Lucas is entirely focused on his movie, Meet the real focus of his life, his three adopted children, 17-year-old Amanda, 10-year-old Katie, and 6-year-old Jet. Did you wash your hands, kiddo? Wait, you want to go wash your hands? Quick, real quick. When? Snow. Okay, let me see. Let's do it. You drive him to school every day? I drive him to school every day. I mean, my, my kids are adopted, and I chose to have my kids, so it's not that they were surprised or I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. You're Mr. Uh, Mom. I'm Mr. Mom. He's both Mr. Mom and Mr. Dad. Yeah. Lucas is a single father, has been ever since 1983, when his 14-year marriage to wife Marcia broke up. They had also been partners. She edited the first Star Wars. Then one day, she walked out. You were crushed by this. this I, was... Yeah, it was very hard. The, the divorce kind of destroyed me, and it took me, did take me a couple of years to sort of unwind myself and come out of it. And then... You didn't see it coming. Uh, no, no, I didn't. You were happy, everything was fine, and I was there was another I, man, and you didn't yeah, know. He was 10 years younger than I was. It's one of those classic divorce situations. You know, he told us that, that the divorce really knocked the legs out from under him. It did. He, he told, it did. It pulverized him. George and Marcia, for me, were the reason you got married, because it was an insurance policy that marriages do work, and, 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 and that working together and living together and having understandings on many, many different planes does work. And when it didn't work, and when that marriage didn't work, I, I lost my faith in marriage for a long time. Ready for takeoff? Takeoff. When his marriage didn't work, Lucas turned all his attention to Amanda, the baby they had adopted. She lived with him, and he went on to adopt Katie and Jet on his own. He says he has known he was meant to be a dad from the very start. The moment my first daughter was born, Amanda, it was just like a bolt of lightning hit me. From that moment on, that became my first priority. I didn't think it was going to be, because before that, making films was my first priority, and that was what I was immersed in, and that was my life. But then I realized that this was my life. And then within a year, I was divorced, and it really was my life. So I just simply said, okay, I'm retiring. And I put my companies and, the, and making movies and everything on the side. You didn't and, retire. Well, you were doing everybody called me said I was retired. Okay, Katie, here's the perfect soft walk, I think. So everyone who's been wondering why there hasn't been a new Star Wars movie in 15 years finally has the answer. George Thank Lucas has been too busy making home movies. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love this. Here's the shot right here. It's like... You raised those kids as a mother, really. Francis Ford Coppola, director of The Godfather, was Lucas's professional mentor and remains a sort of older brother figure. Why did he adopt children? Do you understand? He wanted to have a family. He saw what my kids meant to me. He, he realized that that was really, in the end, all you have. He puts his life ahead of his work, always has. 
And then at, when they're at school and when they're occupied, George runs a small little kingdom called Lucasfilm. <laughs> Only a Steven Spielberg could call that kingdom small. Can you tick off quickly for us all the different components of your company? The, the core company is Lucasfilm, which makes TV shows and films. Lucas Digital, which is Skywalker Sound, which does post-production and sound on lots of movies. Movies like Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan and Jim Cameron's Titanic. Iceberg, right ahead! And those directors bring the film here. And directors bring their films up here. Work and, with your people. And finish them up here. Up here is an amazing place called Skywalker Ranch. Lucas bought these 3,000 acres about an hour north of San Francisco with the profits from Star Wars. But the whole place feels old-fashioned. This Grand Victorian is his headquarters. He chose every detail, like the stained glass dome and the redwood in this library, salvaged from an old railroad bridge. Oh, look at that. I never did get through all the companies. Oh, you want to do that real fast? Yeah, just, oh, let me get through oh, you that. I just want to finish. But I also have LucasArts, which is a game company that does video games. And um, then I have a company, Lucas Learning, that does multimedia for education. And the THX, which is a sound system for the home and for theaters. And um, I've left something out, and I can't remember what it is. He left out Lucas Licensing, which rakes in the millions from all those Star Wars toys and books. And, of course, the crown jewel, Industrial Light and Magic. In all, Lucas has more than 2,000 employees. Everything I've gotten involved in as a businessman has been things that I've enjoyed and loved in my creative life. Which are you? Are you the creative person more than you're the businessman or vice versa? Well, that's hard to separate because I'm the blend. So you, you are know, the blend. I am, I am the blend. That blend has won Lucas enormous wealth and independence. He's financing the new Star Wars film entirely on his own to the tune of $120 million. It's one of those things that's ironic in life. I never, ever thought I'd be a businessman. My father wanted me to go into business with him. He ran a stationery store, and I said, I am never, ever going to become a businessman. And he was very upset. It's probably the biggest thing, the biggest conflict we ever had. Lucas was his father's only son, growing up with three sisters in Modesto, California. Small town, old-fashioned Americana. He remembers it fondly. So much so, he made a movie about it, American Graffiti. There's a very wicked 55 Chevy looking for you. Yeah, I know. You were one of the guys in American Graffiti. Yeah, I was all the guys in American Graffiti. All of them. <laughs> so you were one of those greasers. Ooh. At one point. Cruising. Cruising. Up and down I did a lot of girls. cruising. Yeah, that's, I spent four years of my life doing that. Until a terrible accident three days before his high school graduation. I wasn't just in an accident. I was in an accident that, by all logic, I should have been killed. A car accident. A car accident. My car rolled about eight or nine times and then wrapped itself around a walnut tree. And by some miracle, when I was, the car was rolling, the seatbelt broke, which it should never have done, and threw me out before it hit the tree. And you go through kind of an experience like that, and you say, well, how did I survive? Why did I survive? But it did change your life. It did change my life. I should have been killed at that moment. I wasn't. And so that everything I have after this is a gift and that I should use it wisely. After the accident, Lucas developed a ferocious single-mindedness, determined to make it as a filmmaker on his own terms. When I first met George, I saw somebody with a point of view that was so strong, he didn't allow anybody else's point of view to be, you know, I mean, when George sees something, uh, he sees it through one set of eyes, and that's it. And, and, and thank God for that, but it's also a little bit harder for all of us friends to, you know, get our ideas in there because George really, like any artist, uh, he has a way of seeing, and it's exclusively his. The force is with you, young Skywalker. You can see Lucas's point of view in his movies. Good is good, evil is evil. Old-fashioned romance, no nudity or bad language. Sir, sir, I isolated the reverse power plug coupling. Lucas sees himself as a teacher. One of his friends calls him Yoda in a flannel shirt. Do or do not. There is no try. Are you concerned, though, that, that you might be preaching a little bit? Um, well, I'm not sure whether preaching is such a bad thing. 
for a movie maker? For anybody. What I hear most in my life, from my kids anyway, is dad not on a lecture. And I think most parents get that. Uh, and so being a parent, being a dad, I can't help but lecture. You know, it's in my nature. You bow and then you realize, oh, the spoon's there. Filmmaking is also so much in his nature that single parent or not, he finally couldn't resist directing another Star Wars film. And action! I had put myself in a position where I was totally financing the movie with my own company, and if I wanted to leave at 6 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock, and I could say, we're just going to go another day over schedule, I could do it. I could just say, it's my money, and I'm going home. Do you know what you remind me of? You remind me of my girlfriends who work and have children. <laughs> Well, you do. I, you don't sound like a guy who has children. You sound like one of my women friends who have children. Well, I think anybody that has children. I mean, no, if, you, if you have no. to raise them by yourself, you uh, and you love them, you. I don't see how you could have any other point of view on it. You don't have to spend much time around him to know that Lucas really loves being a dad. There's just one thing missing. I've been very lucky with my kids. I'm lucky in love, but I'm unlucky with kids. Okay, you brought it up. Love. Do you have a girlfriend? I don't have a girlfriend. I um, have a lot of friends that are women. Uh, and um, did, did, the, did the divorce hurt you so badly that that's well, going to be it, you think? I don't know. I, I fell in love a couple of years later after that. I fell in love with uh, another woman. and, and um, Linda Ronstadt? Yeah. <laughs> you don't and, have many secrets. Uh, and... Um, but, uh, you know, she was somebody who just didn't want to get married. And uh, eventually I wanted to get married. And, and, you know, I think as you get older and as you get burned a few times, uh, you either get wary or wiser, I don't know which, but uh, I guess I'm wary and wiser and older. <laughs> and I have a big life. And I have three kids. And he has very high standards. I mean, he wants Queen Noor or, or Grace Kelly or someone. She can't be too tall. And... She has to be wonderful with her kids, and I'm always saying, George, look at her, she's nice, you know. Let me introduce you. Although he sort of says he doesn't think it's in the cards, I don't really believe that. But you think he'll fall in love? I think he will. I'm, I'm sure he will. I'm sure she exists. I don't have the intimacy and the sharing that you can have in a, in a marriage. Uh, but I have pretty much everything else. You told a New Yorker that you cannot direct a movie and be a single parent yes. at the same time. Well, now I've done it. You've done it. <laughs> Explain that. I brought them with me when I made the movie. They hung around on the set. Katie was in the wardrobe department. Amanda was in the makeup department. Jet ro rode the camera dolly every day. And they loved the special effects and things. So they all could be a part of it. So I was able to, to finally do it. Okay, cut. Geologists claim Puget Sound was formed by tectonic activity and carved by glaciers. Indian legend says that Father Ocean carved the trough and raised the mountains to keep his children, cloud and rain, near him. Whatever one believes, most agree that Puget Sound is a special place. Flanked by Seattle, Washington to the east and the Olympic National Forest to the west, the Puget Sound region is remarkable for both its natural beauty and its industrial success. It is home to aircraft manufacturers, military installations, huge lumber operations, and a wide variety of agricultural and maritime activities. Yet it remains a picturesque natural wonder. It's easy to see why so many people call Puget Sound home. America joined the air war in Europe on August 17, 1942. To defend the nation, the U.S. Army Air Corps issued an order for a multi-engine bomber, one that could carry its payload deep into enemy territory and still fight its way out. Answering that call was one of the most famous high-altitude bombers of all time, the B-17 Flying Fortress. With a crew of eight, it carried a bomb load of about 6,000 pounds. B-17s were especially successful at daylight precision attacks on military targets and key industries. They were used in the Pacific, too, some outfitted for reconnaissance or transport, and even air-sea rescue missions carrying lifeboats. 
Combat in a B-17 was described as nerve-stretching, noise-deafening, and physically exhausting. But the Flying Fortress is remembered by those who flew it as tough, heavily armed, and capable of absorbing a tremendous amount of punishment. The B-17 Flying Fortress, one of the great airplanes of World War II. Sixty Minutes, a CBS News magazine, will continue. The three-string shamisen. It's one of the most popular Japanese musical instruments. It was introduced to Japan from China by way of the Ryukyu Islands. In skillful hands, the shamisen renders a great variety of tones. It's indispensable to the kabuki theater, the geisha, and to a great variety of folk music. The shamisen, an integral part of life in Japan. This is how Yakota looks clean. Add a little trash, litter, junk, and top it off with garbage, and Yakota does not look clean anymore. You can help keep Yakota clean by disposing of your garbage, junk, litter, and trash properly. Help keep Yakota clean. Birthdays, holidays, anniversaries. Any day is a great day to say it with flowers. Yakota's flower shop can meet all your needs, from fresh cut flowers to arrangements to potted plants. So stop by the flower shop today. Open daily in Yakota's mini mall. The lake. Just me and my wife and fishing. Do something I've wanted to do since college. Go back to college. Secure your retirement with U.S. savings bonds. The safe, easy way to save. Get them where you work or bank. U.S. savings bonds. Seinfeld Thursday. It's the Puerto Rican Day Parade. The streets are all blocked. I think every Puerto Rican in the world is out here. It is our day. 8 p.m. AFN Thursday. Ooh, wrong the last time America went to war, it was against Saddam Hussein in the Gulf. Now, eight years later, we're at war again, this time against Slobodan Milosevic in Kosovo. What's escaped the notice of most Americans is a particularly disturbing piece of unfinished business left over from that last military campaign in the Gulf almost a decade ago. It's a tale right out of Kafka, a bizarre set of circumstances that has landed six Iraqis in an American prison. Six Iraqis who worked alongside the CIA to overthrow Saddam Hussein and were brought to this country by the U.S. government. If our intelligence community saw them as heroic, why did our immigration service see them as dangerous? The men are being held at a remote prison in the middle of the Mojave Desert under circumstances they say are more reminiscent of the country they left than the country they hoped would become their new home. I never ex uh, expect this, uh, uh, this is the treatment from the United States government uh, put me in jail and separated from my family. And now two years in jail for nothing, for no reason. I never did anything wrong, never. I came here to this country illegally. I was brought by this country, by this government to this country. All six were members of U.S.-backed Iraqi opposition groups trying to overthrow Saddam Hussein from base camps in northern Iraq, which they called Kurdistan. But when Saddam's army overran the town of Erbil in August 1996, they and 6,000 other Iraqi dissidents fled for their lives across the border to refugee camps in Turkey. Later, the U.S. government evacuated all 6,000 of them to an American military base on Guam. You can see that, that uh, in just saying hi to the kids and the families, that they're very, very pleased to be here. There's that look of enthusiasm on their face. On Guam, they were interviewed by the Immigration Service, given civics classes on the U.S. Constitution, and invited to apply for political asylum. Later, hundreds were flown to the United States aboard civilian aircraft leased by the Defense Department. They expected a warm welcome, but as soon as these six men arrived on U.S. soil, they were thrown into jail. What for? They were told that they had tried to enter the United States without the proper paperwork, even though they had been brought here by the U.S. government. Niels Frenzen is one of their lawyers. I, I want to smile when I say this, um, because our clients uh, were, were incredulous when, they were, when the charges were first read to them in court. The INS has charged our clients with being aliens seeking to come to the United States without the necessary tourist visa. They needed a tourist visa? 
they needed a tourist visa um, or a student visa or a business visa, uh, that is indeed the position of the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service. Francis Richard Can you Elder. get a tourist visa for the United States in Kurdistan? We, we actually, we know the answer to that is no. The lack of visas was simply the legal grounds for detaining the six Iraqis and not the reason they're being held. They can't get visas because the Immigration Service has decided they may be double agents and present a threat to national security. Why? The INS won't say. It's a secret. It's not a little bit like what Joseph K. Uh, went through in Kafka's uh, book, The Trial. It's exactly like what Joseph K. went through. You're accused, but you don't know what you're accused of. James Wolsey knows a little bit about secrets and a little bit about double agents. From 1993 to 1995, he was director of the Central Intelligence Agency. So what, what happened was the Immigration Service said, uh, I'm sorry, you're a threat to the security of the United States. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to tell you why, because it's secret. Right. Sure. After the Iraqis contacted Wolsey about the case, he became convinced that justice could not be served unless the defendants at least knew the nature of the charges against them. So he donated his services to the defense team. Wolsey thought with all of his security clearances, the INS might allow him to review the classified material and assist the defense without compromising national security. That was a year ago. They don't know what they're accused of. I don't know what they're accused of. Nobody outside the government knows what they're accused of. Did the INS think you couldn't keep a secret? Uh, I don't know. But you're a former director of the CIA. Oh, that's right. Equally distressing to Wolsey was the fact that most of the Iraqi prisoners didn't seem like enemies of the United States. Safa al-Batat was one of the best-known opposition fighters in Iraq participated in an insurrection against Saddam at the end of the Gulf War, then joined forces with the Iraqi National Congress, the largest of the resistance groups in the north. How many times has Saddam Hussein tried to kill you? Three times. He escaped with head injuries when someone blew up his house, got shot when someone ambushed his car, and nearly died when someone poisoned him with a substance called thallium. What is thallium? It is a poisonous substance without taste or color that can be placed in any beverage or food. A few grams can kill an animal. Saddam killed a lot of opponents this way. Do you know um, how you were poisoned? I know exactly who poisoned me and how he poisoned me. He put it in my Pepsi. He admitted he was a part of the Iraqi intelligence service. The assassination attempt was very well documented. In order to save his life, al Batat was flown to Britain and treated by a team of specialists at Cardiff Hospital. When I reached Britain, the specialist couldn't believe what he saw. When they examined me, they said the dose you were given is enough to kill a camel. But for some reason, the INS apparently believed Mr. al Batat was lying about the poisoning incident, despite plenty of evidence to the contrary. It all came out last summer when several senators began looking into the case. And the INS was forced to admit that 90% of the secret material it had gathered against the Iraqi prisoners shouldn't have been classified at all. Most of it was totally uncorroborated. And when it was finally declassified, much of the information wasn't only worthless, some of it was incredulous, like the reason the INS didn't believe that Safa el batat had been poisoned. Turns out it came from an anonymous Iraqi refugee on Guam during an interview conducted by FBI agents. What they said, and one of them said, was that he may have been taking rat poison recreationally. <laughs> you know, that, that's like the 13th chime of a clock. Not only is it bizarre in and of itself, but it calls into question everything that comes from the same source. And we checked with internists, we, we checked with uh, experts on pharmacology. They said that uh, nobody's heard of this kind of rat poison being used recreationally. <laughs> What kind of effect does it have? Uh, it uh, makes you bleed from all bodily orifices. It's, uh, it's an absolutely hideous thing. You don't know anybody who's ever taken it for fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> Before he retired, Warren Merrick was senior CIA officer on the ground in northern Iraq at the same time Safa al batat and two other prisoners were working for the Iraqi National Congress. Any chance you think that they're Iraqi agents? I think it's very unlikely. You looked at the material that has been declassified? Yes. How would you characterize it? Uh, it's not evidence. It's, I see nothing that, that shows that these people are, are a danger to the United States. 
did anybody call you and ask you to take a look at this stuff and try and evaluate the intelligence that came out of Guam, these FBI reports? No, they did not. Dr. Ali Yassin Kareem came under suspicion because he supposedly lied to FBI agents about his last name, which they claimed was Eufaili. But it is not my name. Turns out it's not his name. In fact, it's not really a name at all, but a Kurdish word used to describe someone's cultural background. The INS also flagged the fact that he was well-educated and well-traveled, a sign he must have powerful friends in Baghdad. But in fact, Dr. Ali was the personal physician of Ahmed Chalabi, the president of the Iraqi National Congress, the largest of the groups trying to overthrow Saddam. Chalabi also told us that Dr. Ali treated Warren Merrick and other CIA personnel in Iraq and could have poisoned all of them if he'd wanted to. If these men were released, would you take them back? Yes. No doubts about their loyalty to the opposition of, to Saddam Hussein? Not at all. They, they were inveterate fighters against Saddam. They were uh, brave. Uh, I say to you that uh, t t at least two of them, if they were Saddam agents and they had wanted to kill me, they would have, I would have been dead. They were with me all the time. INS General Counsel Paul Virtue says he's heard all of this before, that Chalabi, James Wolsey, and Warren Merrick have all offered testimony in the case, which he says is now being heard by the Immigration Board of Appeals. They've filed a brief and will be filing soon filing a reply brief. So there is a process for dealing with it. Very slow one, apparently. I mean, they've been in prison for two years. That's how long the process has, uh, has taken. I mean, if you look at that material that is recently declassified, I mean, there's no hard evidence of any kind that would seem to warrant these men being detained. The immigration court looked at that evidence, and they looked, and she, the immigration judge looked at the classified evidence as well, and on the basis of that uh, totality, uh, made a determination that, the, that they are ineligible. Some of this stuff is laughable. Well, I, I am not, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to discuss uh, the individual cases or, or the evidence in the individual cases. What's the mental state of these prisoners right now? They are at the lowest uh, emotional and mental state that they've been in uh, for the past two years. One of the marriages is already broken up, and one prisoner, Mohammed Tuma, has twice tried to commit suicide. They took my children away from me, and they leave me alone here. And I don't know what will happen in the future for me. Tuma's wife and children, along with the families of three other prisoners, were allowed to enter the United States and have been resettled by the government more than a thousand miles away in Lincoln, Nebraska. The children have not seen their fathers in more than two years, and the mothers are having trouble paying the phone bills and the rent. None of the women wanted their faces shown for fear of retribution against their families in Iraq. Since coming here, we haven't lived. We've been destroyed. And it's a hard time. Uh, I have so hard time. So no family, no friends, no husband, no nothing. I'm sorry. What kind of an impact does it have on intelligence gathering to have a situation like this develop? It can only have a very negative impact when someone who has helped the United States then is lured to the United States and then thrown into jail and stays there. Um, it's not good for any sort of intelligence operation. The word gets out. The word gets out, and it certainly has gotten out in this case. One of the most uh, poignant things is when this started happening to these men, they turned to their lawyers in California, who are very good lawyers, and they said, you must be awful lawyers because we've been studying this, and we know about the Bill of Rights, and we know that you can confront your accusers, and, and that's not happening here so you must be failing you must be terrible lawyers we asked Wolsey if it was possible that somewhere in the remaining 10 percent of the allegations yet to be declassified against the jailed Iraqis that there might be some credible accusations to make all of this plausible I mean is it possible that in that 10 percent that they're still holding on to there are some very serious incredible allegations that make all of this plausible it's not impossible uh, it's not impossible that there is something serious with respect to one or more of the men in there someplace. But you don't know unless you can look at it, at least lawyers with security clearances and some experience in dealing with these things. It 
It's the only way to test this sort of uh, thing is with cross-examination. So you still want to see the 10%? Sure, absolutely. That's not likely to happen. We're told that since we began working on this story, the INS has offered the men a deal. If they admit guilt to entering the country without a visa and forfeit all of their rights to an appeal, the INS will parole them with electronic bracelets until they can be relocated in some country where their lives are not in danger. Not much of a deal. But they seem inclined to accept it, accept anything that will finally get them out of prison. Who has pots, pans, canvas, plates, bowls, coffee mugs, silverware, steak knives, measuring measuring cups, cups, rollers, balls, rice, coffee cups, cups child vacuum cars, cleaners, fans, fans and, and heaters, all for you to check out? Yakota's Family Services, that's who. You can use these items for up to 90 days, so you'll have something to eat on while waiting for your household goods to arrive. Family Services is open weekdays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Just stop by Building 535 and let the Family Services staff load you up with all kinds of stuff. And it's all free. Thinking about buying a house, a place that provides for your individual needs, that you and your loved ones can call home sweet home. Finding and buying your ideal home is a lengthy and complicated process, but the FSC can help. Check out their Buying and Selling a Home seminar. You'll learn all the ins and outs of this major investment, so you can make your dream home a reality. If you plan on buying a home, call the FSC at 225-8725 and ask about the Buying and Selling a Home seminar. Coming up on the next edition of Pacific Reports, a Misawa squadron leaves home to support Operation Southern Watch. We'll see folks from the 14th Fighter Squadron taking off for a routine deployment to Saudi Arabia. And we'll take a look at what it takes to run a weather flight in Alaska. We'll see airmen there with their hands full during the winter months as they help keep pilots at Isleson Air Force Base safe. Be sure and join us for these stories and much more on our next edition of Pacific Reports. Hi, I'm Leslie Nielsen. I am best known for my roles in comedy. There's one thing I take very seriously. That's my hearing. You see, just like one out of every ten of us, I have a hearing loss. I was able to overcome my hearing loss, though, thanks to hearing aids. Now, if you or someone you know has a hearing loss, or if you'd like more information, call the Hearing Helpline for this free booklet, Help Through Hearing Aids, at 1-800-EARWELL. Discover a world of better hearing. Monday primetime begins with the news magazine 60 Minutes. Then catch the comedy on Sports Night and Everybody Loves Raymond. From the streets to the courts, law and order. AFN Tonight. I guess you had to be around during World War II to fully understand why we had no choice but to go to war in Kosovo. Andy Rooney was. When I was in college, Adolf Hitler was trying to take over Europe. There was a political movement here called America First, led by a senator from Montana named Burton K. Wheeler. America First was telling everyone that Europe's problem was none of our business, and I agreed. Some philosopher I'd read in college had written that any peace is better than any war. And that seemed true to me. Why should I die for someone else's freedom? I was certain it was wrong for Americans to get involved in the war in faraway Europe. The draft board didn't care what I thought and I was dragged out of college and into the army kicking and screaming. After following the tanks and the infantry across France and into Germany as a reporter for the Stars and Stripes, I got to a small prison camp in a town named Tekla. About 250 Jewish prisoners in it had been forced as slave labor to make wings for German fighter planes. When the guards heard we were coming, they poured gas on the roofs of two of the barracks and with the prisoners still inside, set them on fire. Two days later, I got to Buchenwald. By this time, I knew how wrong the idea of America first was. I've never forgotten how dumb I was, thinking it was someone else's war. I smile and shake my head now when I hear a young senator say the slaughter of the Albanians in Kosovo is none of our business. Not really a smile, I guess. I don't know what it is. I'm saying to myself, I understand, Senator. I used to be as wrong as you are. The argument against our involvement in Yugoslavia is that we can't correct every evil in every part of the world. Well, of course we can't, but that doesn't make it wrong for us to stop the slaughter in Kosovo if we can. A doctor doesn't turn you down as a patient because he can't cure the whole world. We have the weapons, we have the money, 
We have the moral authority. We even have some help from other countries this time. There's nothing in it for us. No big oil companies going to make money, no bankers. All we'll get out of it is the good feeling of knowing we're helping a lot of poor bastards who don't have the power to help themselves. It didn't seem as if I'd ever say it about him a few months ago, but I trust President Clinton in this matter. I trust my country. I'm proud. Mail is still coming in about our story on the Boston nanny. A lot of it from viewers convinced we did it only to increase our ratings, which incidentally it didn't. No matter, here's a sample. Shame on 60 Minutes for giving into trash journalism for the sake of advertising dollars. Followed by, how dare Mike Wallace sympathize with a nanny just for a story on 60 Minutes. Andy Rooney is the most sensible person you have. There was also a letter with a theory about the case so bizarre that we couldn't resist including it in our sample. The judge in that case was obviously hoping for romantic favors in exchange for declaring her conviction manslaughter and not second-degree murder. And finally, a viewer who declined to give his full name asked, why wouldn't the nanny take a lie detector test? The fact is she did, from one of the top polygraph experts in the country, and passed it with flying colors. I'm Steve Croft. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. Wednesday on 60 Minutes 2, Dan Rather looks at a minister who some consider to be an American terrorist, and Mike Wallace on the troubled life of Judy Garland, 60 Minutes Classic, Wednesday.